friends, welcome to another episode of Strength for Today. I'm your host here, Eric Dykstra. I'm so glad that you're with us today. Today, we get to dive in to two particular passages. One in Matthew 17, the Mount of Transfiguration, and the other one is going to be several passages in John where Jesus makes these I am statements, telling us exactly who he is and how he represented who his father was. Because on Monday, we talked about when Moses encountered God at the burning bush in Exodus chapter three, and God himself made the statement, I am who I am to Moses. And this was really a game-changing moment in the life of Moses that established a new part of his identity as being one that was going to deliver the Israelites out of slavery and take them into the promised land to be free people. And so we get to discover today all the wonderful statements of who Jesus is and how they represent the heart of who God says he is for us. So we have a, an incredible example and we're going to dive into these. So let's do it. Have you ever had a time in your life where you felt like you're missing the mark or part of your identity has been robbed or, or stolen because of choices that you've made? This is often the case for us. And I've had several times in my life where I feel like I haven't been living into my true identity and I need to be restored and I need to be healed in areas so that I can come into the fullness of who God has made me to be and what he's called me, much like Moses when he spent 40 years in the wilderness to be prepared and to have his heart made right and pure and healed to deliver the Israelite nation to be free. So let's dive into some of those statements in which Jesus says, I am. This is going to help us look at him because as we look at him, we get a better picture of who we are and we have to know what he says about himself so that we can better understand who we are and who he can be in us, but also through us. So in John chapter six, Jesus makes the statement that I am the bread of life. And take notice of where this happened and why it happened. This statement comes just after Jesus fed the 5,000 people. In Matthew 4, 4, when Jesus is being led into the wilderness and he's tempted, he said that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. In part of the Israelites' deliverance, when they were being set free from the bondage, was that God provided manna for them every single night they went to sleep. When they woke up the next morning, there was fresh manna. So all throughout scripture, God gives us this statement is that I am the bread of life. What does bread do? It nourishes us. It gives us a source of the nutrients and the resources that our bodies need in order to live. And that's what Jesus is saying that he is. And this is right after he demonstrated that he's not just saying it, but he just demonstrated it, that he multiplied the food that provided for so many people. That's an incredible statement. So God wants to be the bread of life for each one of us, for you as well. The second one is in John chapter eight. He says, I am the light of the world. And this is right before he healed a blind man. It's always significant of when and where these things happen. Jesus makes this statement of, I am the light of the world. And not only does he say it here again, but he actually demonstrated it by allowing a person that couldn't see to actually see in the physical realm. That's what God does for us. He illuminates our heart. He illuminates our mind and he gives us his thoughts and he shows us his ways. And it's like being in a very dark place. If you've ever been in a dark place and you light a light, the darkness cannot penetrate and cannot overwhelm the light. The light always wins out. So Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And when we give ourselves to Christ, when we enter into relationship, he illuminates everything in our life and he becomes our ability to see things in a whole new way. He is the light of your world. Number three, he says, I am the door in chapter 10, 
of the Gospel of John. And this is helping people to understand how to enter the kingdom. He says that you must come through him, that he is the only way, the door. Because we can try so many different aspects and, and avenues of how to get to God by pleasing people, by performing, by pursuing pleasure. You know, these are all things that we can try to do in order to be in God's presence, but it's really pretty simple and profound. He just says, Jesus is the door. There's no other way. So coming to the Father through Jesus, he just says, I am the door. And then in that same chapter, he says, I am the good shepherd. Well, what does this tell us about who God is for us? He says that he's good, that he's a shepherd. Well, what does a shepherd do? It takes care of its sheep. And when the shepherds would often bring their sheep into the pen, they would often lead them in themselves and they would go first and the sheep would follow. So we have an example in Jesus that actually goes where he's leading us first. He's been there. He's been through the suffering. He's been through the pain that maybe you've experienced. Is that not comforting? He's a good shepherd. He's your good shepherd. He's a protector and he shows his love and his care and he has compassion on those of us, his children, that he calls his sheep. A great, beautiful picture and an image of God and Jesus, the Holy Spirit, saying, I am. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. Number five, he says, I am the resurrection and the life in John chapter 11. This was actually right uh, made before raising Lazarus. So here's the key to that as well. He's making this statement that I am the resurrection and the life. He doesn't just tell us, this is a common pattern. Then he goes and shows them by raising Lazarus. He's got power over death and he brings us back to life. Let that settle in your spirit today and be encouraged that when you enter into a relationship, you get to live in the resurrection power of who his son Jesus was. That is good news, my friend. Number six, he is the way, the truth, and the life. In John 14, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Apart from me, you cannot come to the Father. Jesus isn't just one of many ways to God. He is the only way. And he claims God's word is truth. He says, I am the truth. In John chapter one, it said, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. The gospel of John portrays this beautifully that Jesus is the word of God incarnate, is Emmanuel, God with you, God with us. He's the way, he's the truth, and he is the life. The seventh one, he says, I am the true vine. In John 15, verses 1 through 10, one of my favorite passages, he says, I am the vine. So he's the source that's going to provide the life and the nutrients that you need for your life. Much like when he said, I am the bread of life. He says, if you're connected to me, he says, you are the branch. The branch is connected to the vine. The vine provides the life. You are the branch. He's, his life is coming into your very being through the power and ministry and the person of the Holy Spirit who dwells in you because you're in one uh, spirit with him and you're in union with Christ as part of your new creation identity. You are joined with him. So receive that power in life that comes through the vine, who's the true source of our life. These are incredible statements that Jesus made in the gospel of John. So that when you feel insecure in your identity, go back to these times where God revealed himself. Here's a great example in an exercise that you can do. Get a piece of paper out and on one side of that paper, Maybe there's things in your life that you're having a hard time believing about yourself, 
or maybe it's the I am not statements that maybe have been defining your life. Maybe you've been saying, I'm not worthy, or I'm not accepted, or I'm not loved. Maybe you haven't felt these things. I'm not good at fill in the blank. A lot of times, those are that is the voice of the enemy telling us everything that we're not, and then it becomes part of our identity, and then it holds us back from moving and living from the identity that God has truly given you. So on the other half of that paper, then, ask Jesus, who are you, and who am I? And then see what comes to mind and begin writing those out. Jesus, these seven statements in John are perfect examples of spiritual identity statements that Jesus uses for his life. And he declares them and he speaks them forward. And if Jesus is these things, he says, I am the bread of life. You have access to that through the new covenant relationship that you've entered into him with. So maybe you feel weary and tired, or maybe you feel spiritually hungry, and you've been dry. Well, he says, I am the bread of life. So you can make a statement of, I am full. I am filled with the Holy Spirit in the person of Jesus. I am worthy because Jesus was worthy of his father's affection and love. And if Jesus is in you, you are worthy. So a declaration that you can make today is, I am worthy. I am accepted because of Jesus before the Father. Jesus is accepted. Therefore, you are accepted to the Father. I am capable. Maybe there's things that you haven't felt capable of, and you may need to say, I am. Maybe you haven't been, uh, in your own eyes, a good spouse a good husband, a good father, a good mother, a good wife. But now Jesus is part of that experience and he's telling you, you are a good wife. You are a good husband, a good father, a good wife. Let me tell you who you are and begin to open your ears and listen to what he has to say to you because he'll enable you and he'll give you access into everything that your heart desires to be if we'll allow him to, and if we'll take on a posture of humility and just let him in. So that's a great, simple exercise that's practical. I've done it several times. When I feel stuck, I just begin to ask Jesus, what are the lies that I'm believing? Everything that I'm saying about myself in the form of I am not statement. Even before starting this podcast this year, there were years that were leading up to this, and I was finding every excuse to put this off. I don't have the gifts and technology. I don't know how to make this work, or I don't have the financial provision to get what I need to make. All those things for years were a hindrance, and really, the beginning of November of last year is when the Lord really started moving me past those statements, and he started to solidify and give me the faith to believe that this is who you are. And really the last five years of your life has been like those 40 years that Moses spent in Midian. And maybe for you, you've been in this desert season where God has been preparing you for something. And maybe you're still in that. Maybe you're coming to the end of that season and getting ready to launch something out there. But believe this that God is with you because he says, I am. So whenever those statements of I am not come up, you allow the Lord and the Holy Spirit and Jesus to say, I am. You may not be, but I am. There have been plenty of moments where I've felt overwhelmed and hopeless. And I've heard the voice of God prompt something inside of me saying, I am hope. I don't get overwhelmed. I am strong. And I let those words of who he is build up strength in my spirit. And I tell them and I confess them and proclaim them over my life. Lord, if you're strong, then I'm strong. Lord, if you're the God of hope, then I'm hopeful and despair will not defeat me. And you continue to say those things over your life and you declare them over your children. And I'll end with these two things in John. 
because there's two other statements that Jesus makes where he says, I am. The Pharisees in John 8 are complaining that Jesus is doing all these things. And Jesus makes the statement before Abraham was born, he says, I am. So Jesus, again, revealing his true identity. And then in the Garden of Gethsemane in John chapter 18, the guards come looking for Jesus and they say, we are looking for Jesus. And Jesus says, I am he. And it says they drew back and they fell to the ground. This demonstrates the authority that Jesus has. I often wonder what that would have been like. Could you imagine being one of those guards? And Jesus says, who are you looking for? And they say, we're looking for Jesus. And Jesus says, I am he. And he carries such authority that the guards literally fall to the ground because of the weight of what he's just said. That's the God you have access to and the God that lives within you. And here's the last passage we'll look at in Matthew 17, when Jesus took the three disciples up to the Mount of Transfiguration. This is a key in how God takes us out of our desert seasons. He gives us a revelation of his glory and his goodness and his majesty. Because the three of them go up there and Peter says, it is good that we are here. It is Peter says this, God's face begins to radiate and his, his garment becomes as white as lightning, it says. And Jesus simply is in the fullness of his glory. Something's transpired here where actually the three disciples now become fearful because of what they're seeing. And they fall to their faces. And imagine this, Jesus walks up to them they're not knowing, and he puts his hand on them, and he says, do not be afraid, but get up, get up, and do not be afraid. How many times do we hear that in scripture? The gentle but bold and confident words of Jesus commanding something in us to rise up. That's what he does to our identity. When we begin to lose sight of it, when we make choices that go against our true identity, and we're living from a place of the flesh and not the spirit, God gives us these encounters out of his goodness, out of his grace, and out of his compassion and mercy that shows us a greater side of who he is. This is what Jesus is doing. He's strengthening the three by taking them to an ascended place on a mountain and showing them more of his glory. Imagine being one of the disciples. They see Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah represented two different things. Moses represented the law. And, and Jesus is saying in this picture, I believe that no longer are you under the law, but I've come to fulfill the law. And now I am before you, the living presence of God himself. Elijah was a forerunner, a prophet that began to prepare the way, the coming he often was a forerunner to John the Baptist who would prepare the way in the wilderness, it says, for Jesus to come. So as this is unfolding, they're seeing the three disciples are seeing Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. And then when he puts his hand on them and he says, get up, do not be afraid. Take, I never caught this before a few weeks ago. It says when they got up and their eyes came up and they only saw Jesus. No longer did they see Moses or Elijah. And I believe that's a picture of what God is doing in the world today. He wants to bring you and I into a place where the only thing that we see is him. Jesus and his beauty, Jesus and his glory. And as we see that, our face begins to radiate. Our heart is transformed. Our image becomes more like him, which I've always said is his primary purpose, is to help you reflect more of who he is to the world around you. Could you imagine coming down from that experience, being one of those three disciples, seeing Jesus in his glory? And notice what Jesus said to the three disciples. He said, don't go and tell people what you've seen until... I've been resurrected. They just encountered the divinity, not just the humanity of Jesus.
And I believe that's another key component of what Jesus is calling you and I to today. He doesn't just want us to know him in his humanity, but he wants us to know him in his divinity, his divine nature. And Peter, Peter, the one who said this on the Mount of Transfiguration, it's good that we're together. In 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter's life has been transformed. He's not the same person that we saw in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and depicted in that. He's matured. He's grown. More of his identity has come forward. Read 2 Peter chapter 1. It says that you have everything according to life and godliness, all the graces, all the rich blessings of the Father are made available to us. And then he lists a list, uh, a list of characteristics. And he says, if you are operating and living from the place of the spirit, you will never be let down and your feet will never stumble. That's stability. That's maturity at its best, at its fullness. Because of God's divine power, working in us through a divine relationship and through divine wisdom, leading us further into the truth of who Jesus is and who Jesus can be in you. So as you go about your day to day and the rest of your week, I want you to just reflect on these I am statements of who Jesus said he was and let him be those things and invite him to be each and every one of those things. Maybe over the course of the next week, you spend one day focusing your mind and attention on one of those I am statements and seeing how God shows up as those things in your life. May you radiate his glory today around you and may his light shine brightly through you because you are beautiful. You are God's creation and you represent his image as only you can to the world around you. So be encouraged, be strengthened today, and we'll hopefully we'll see you here on Friday where we'll do a few more exercises to activate this identity, this new creation that God has said you are. We'll talk to you on Friday.